All right. So that being said, I would like to jump on to today's presentation. You know, like why IC engine simulation is required. Okay, so with respect to presentation, you know, I like, like it to be very interactive. I know that there's only like 11 to 12 people on the call, but you know, I like to ask questions and I like you guys to ask questions as well. So anything that you, you see on the screen, if you have a couple of questions, you know, just let me know. All right. Okay, so why IC engine simulation is required? First, you know, we all know that tight emission control is required by different governments all over the world. And achieving these emission, emission requirements require more than just thorough knowledge of combustion process. If you know how combustion takes place, that's not enough. And what I'm trying to say is you cannot just guess, you cannot just come up with ideas about what's actually happening inside the engine without looking into it. Because any optimization that is possible by just looking at the engine or guessing how it works has already been done because engines are pretty old. So all those low level, all those high level optimizations have already been done. Any additional optimization that you need to do comes only by a lot of research. And computational fluid dynamics or IC engine simulations is a critical part or a critical tool that helps in achieving this. Experiments, you know, are always good, but they're very, very expensive. You know, most of us cannot afford experiments, but all of us can actually perform engineering simulations, right? That's the whole idea. All right, so how should you, as an engineer, um, optimize or think about optimizing an engine. Okay. So at this point, you know, you can think of, you can take like 30 seconds and try to answer this question. So again, the question is like, we are, we are, we are all used to an engine. You probably have a bike or even a car, correct? Um, when you're thinking about optimizing an engine, you know, you try to understand the combustion process. You figure out what the problem is and propose a test and propose and test a solution. Right? So let me ask this question. So you must, have, you must all own a vehicle, right? Either a bike or a car. So based on that, what do you, like what are certain things that can be optimized in an engine? Let's take 30 seconds and guys just type in your responses in the chat box. Fuel consumption, okay. So what is it in the fuel consumption that you want to optimize? We can't. Jayaprakash fuel intake inside cylinder. Again, Jayaprakash, can you tell me what is it that you're trying to optimize? <laughs> Compression ratio. Okay. That's actually a good answer. Like getting the right compression ratio is very important. That's good. How about others? Tamiz, Narendran, Omkar. Ajay, Jagrati. What do you guys think? Tamiz, you can try to join the same call from your desktop if possible. Raj Shekharan Singh, providing a cleaner and richer air fuel mixture to utilize more of the energy stored in the fuels. That's actually a good answer. Okay, how about others? Narendran, I see that you're smiling. So I believe that you know what the answer is. So yeah, just take the time to type in. Like, what do you think? I mean, I'm, I hope you're an engineer. I hope you're still a student. Uh, what do you think is a good way or what do you have some ideas on optimizing an engine if you do just type in your answer we'll, we'll take 10 more seconds guys after that i'll just continue but so far we have had some very good answers which are definitely it's not 100 it, you're, you're thinking in the right direction but uh, you know it could be a bit more detailed <laughs> All right, so I think, uh, you know, that's Raj Shekharan increasing the efficiency of forced induction devices by increasing heat dissipation from them. Okay, increasing the efficiency of forced induction devices, right? So Raj, I think you need to be a bit more clear on your explanation. I mean, there's a still, there's a still a lot of abstract terms 
and I'm not sure how that actually pertains to an engine. So Raj, you have to rephrase your answer a little bit. So go ahead and type it while I continue. All right, so in order to think about how actually all of this occurs, you need to first get an idea about how the entire engine works. And typically, you know, we know that. And, you know, most likely this is the picture that you have in mind. You have fuel and air, and the fuel and air combines, um, they combine to form a fuel air mixture. Okay, and then they combust and emissions are formed. And if this is the picture that you have in mind, like how an engine works, if this is the picture that you have in mind, it's good. I mean, you can think of, for example, you can you can look at each of these blocks. For example, you can just think of the fuel separately. You can think of the air separately. You can think of the mixture separately. You can think of the combustion process separately and emissions separately. In each of these blocks, you can figure out what the problem is and you can come up with a solution. So this is like a classic problem. In uh, this, is a, this is like a classic engineering analysis problem. You first figure out the steps that are involved and you look at the problems in each step and you propose a solution and you test your solution, right? So this is something that we might have studied a lot in our undergraduate education. Now, the problem is this picture of engine combustion process is very, very old. And as a result, many people have already looked at this and many people have tested their ideas and have proposed solutions which are already in production, right? Why is this a problem now? Well, if you want to be more innovative, then you need to know a little bit more than this particular diagram that I'm showing on screen. So if I move ahead, for example, one might say that if I have fuel and fuel air mixture, I can make the mixing process more efficient. In fact, that is the answer that most of you suggested, right? That's because I believe that this is the diagram that you have in your head. And similarly, as far as combustion is involved, you can make the combustion more efficient. Well, if you are thinking of making combustion more efficient, what does that even mean, first of all? So at this point, I would like to ask another question. How do you quantify an efficient combustion process? How do you know that combustion is efficient? Can you actually put a number on that combustion efficiency? If so, how do you calculate that number? Can anyone answer that? How can I quantify the combustion process and how can I say if combustion is efficient or not? All right, so Raj Shekharan, I think you're just following up on your previous answer, splitting the turbochargers, compressor wheel and... Uh... Okay, so in short, Raj, you are basically saying that for the previous question that I asked, you're saying that you can optimize an engine by looking at the intake system. Basically, that's what you're saying. All right. So Vikan, all the fuel should be burned. Okay. But how do you quantify it? But how do you quantify it? Like, how can I actually put a number on it? So for example, you know, if we look at your, if you're, if you look at your mileage, we say that, okay, this is a bike that gives 60 kilometers per liter, and this is a bike that gives 80 kilometer per liter, right? And we know that 80 kilometer per liter is better than 60, right? So, but with respect to combustion, how do you quantify it? Well, octane number is not the right answer. So we can't, your answer is correct, but how do you quantify it? How can you actually measure it? How can you put a number on what you're saying? You're saying that all the fuel should be burnt, right? But how can I, amount of carbon converted into carbon dioxide, right? So Ajay, yes, that's correct. You're basically saying that how much fuel is getting consumed or how much complete combustion is taking place. That's correct. But how do I measure it? That's my question. Right? So these are the things that you need to understand, right? Because most of you are trying to get, most of you are trying to, guess the right answer but then as as far when it comes to actually doing it you need to understand how things can be measured right and see uh, like few, fuel ratio is a good answer but you need to understand that fuel ratio just tells you like what what's the amount of air and what's the amount of fuel that you have but it does not tell you if your combustion process is efficient or not Okay, 
Rajeshwaran by using a bomb calorimeter. Well, we are talking about engines. We are not talking about standalone experiments. So a bomb calorimeter will not, will not be valid. So one thing that you can actually look at is, you can look at the amount of oxygen at the exhaust, right? Because that typically quantifies how effective the combustion process is. Okay, but the metric that people typically look for while designing engines is called as combustion efficiency. So combustion efficiency is a number that you can actually say that, I, that you can actually calculate and it tells you how much percentage of the fuel was completely burnt. And the way you calculate that is quite simple. So you actually look at how the pressure changes as a function of crank angle inside your engine. This plot or this graph is often called as the PV diagram or the pressure trace in an engine. Now, if you compute the area under the curve of this particular diagram, then you get the work done by the engine. Now that is the work that's done by the engine by combusting, all right? And so that's the output. Now what's the input to the engine? You know the amount of fuel that got injected and each fuel has a lower heating value, right? So you take the mass of fuel and multiply that with the lower heating value. That is the total energy input. So you take the output energy divided by the input energy that is going to be your combustion efficiency, right? So if you think about it, the concepts that you use to compute your combustion efficiency are really, really fundamental. And this is one of the things that I see is missing in students. You, when, you are, when you are thinking about an application, we always think of complex ideas, but you need to understand that you need to explain your idea with simpler terms. Only then it means that the idea is clear in your head, else you're just guessing it, okay? So make sure that when you're thinking of a problem, and when you're proposing an idea, you can actually explain why that idea would work. All right. Moving on emissions. So the other, the final block is the emissions. And what you can think of is designing equipment that act as emission solutions. Popular devices include catalytic converter, NOx trap, SCR, and so on. But Here's the problem though. As I said, if you just have this particular picture of the combustion process, you often miss the global picture, right? So if this is the entire map of a combustion process in your head, then you are limited to this diagram. So any problem that you are going to propose a solution to needs to come from this particular block. But as I said before, this is something that people have already looked at several times. Right? So it's going to be impossible for you to come up with a new strategy. So what you need to do is you need to first do a literature survey and first be familiar with what is the state of the combustion or what is the state of you know, the entire combustion process in a detailed way. And that is what we are going to be looking at next. And looks like we have a comment. So one question, how to deal with thermal stress in IC engine? Well. Here's the thing, right? So your question is very, very abstract. When you say how to deal with thermal stress, what does that even mean? So when you say deal with thermal stress, do you say that thermal stress should be zero or what is, what is your exact question? Your question is very, very unclear. That's what I'm trying to say. And just think about your statement, right? Think about the statement you made. Like, how can we deal with the thermal stress in an, in an IC engine? Given thermal stress takes place or occurs because of combustion process, correct? So as long as combustion is there, thermal stresses are always going to be there. So you cannot completely get rid of it. If you're getting rid of it, that means that you don't have any combustion. How to reduce thermal expansion? Now that's again, right? The other question you need to understand, ask is why do you have to reduce thermal expansion? What's the requirement? Right? So just, so, bef so when you're thinking, when you feel like there's something is a problem, just try to understand why it's a problem, right? So when you're saying that, when you say that how to reduce thermal expansion, in anything that's going to get heated is going to expand. So you cannot make thermal expansion zero without combustion. 
sorry, with combustion. If there is combustion, thermal expansion will always be there. Now it needs to be an extent where there is less engine damage. And that is where material scientists come into play. They basically look at material properties and as long as the material can withstand the combustion uh, process, your engine life is going to have a set value, right? And that is how people deal with it. Okay, now let's actually look at the detailed diagram of how the combustion process takes place. And it starts with all the way from the fuel. So when you select a fuel, you need to look at the fuel components. When I say fuel components, what percentage of the fuel contains alkanes? What, con what percentage of the fuel contains uh, aromatics? Right? These are important questions that you need to ask because they, are, they affect something called as the vaporization characteristics and also the physical properties of the fuel. Why is this important? But before I do that, I need to ask a question. What does vaporization characteristic mean? Can anyone tell me? So my question is, what does, when I say vaporization characteristics, what does it mean? How it behaves when it is vapor? Well, no, that's not correct. So again, right, so these are important things that you need to ask. And how fast the fuel changes its state of matter? Well, that's also not 100% accurate. Vapor pressure? No, that's not correct. So the vaporization characteristics, yes, you, you guys are right in a sense that it deals with, okay, how is my liquid fuel getting converted to vapor? That is correct. But the more important question is, if you look at a fuel, it contains thousands of components. When I say thousands, it literally contains thousands or even more. But the problem is when the fuel is actually vaporizing, it does not vaporize linearly. Meaning, say that the, the say that you heat the say that you heat the fuel at a particular temperature, and say that X percentage of the fuel gets vaporized at a given interval of time. Okay, so there is a vaporization rate. Now, when you change the temperature, when you increase the temperature two times, your vaporization rate might not increase two times. So this is called as the distillation curve. The distillation curve basically says that at what temperature, what percentage of the fuel is getting vaporized. Now, this is very similar to fractional distillation that you guys might have studied in your 12th standard or also in your engineering chemistry course. This is very important because in your engine, the temperature is continuously changing and different engines have different peak temperatures or operating temperatures. So the fuel that you're selecting needs to vaporize in an efficient manner <clears throat> when injected, okay? This is called as a distillation curve. You need to be familiar with this. And similarly, physical properties. We might have all studied viscosity, density, thermal conductivity, and so on. But why is it important for the fuel? Like what happens if my viscosity increases? What is the effect that this is going to have on my engine? You need to understand that. And to understand all these things, you need to have very strong fundamentals. Okay, so this is just selecting the fuel. Then comes your injection system. In your injection system, there are so many things that you need to ask. And each of these questions needs to be answered by thorough analysis. For example, what is the injection pressure <clears throat> that you're going to have? What is the nozzle configuration? Are you going to have a single nozzle or are you going to have a multi-point uh, multi injection system? How is your injection rate shape going to be? How is your injection orientation going to be? How is the injection timing going to be? All these questions need to be answered by proper research because each and every parameter listed affects your final combustion efficiency. Then comes, your, then comes the physics of uh, fuel atomization. How does the breakup process take place? How does vaporization take place? How does film formation takes place? And then like when breakup takes place, two fuel parcels can hit each other and they can coalesce. How does that take place? So this is just on the fuel side. 
in the air in the air intake side side what is the engine load condition because depending on the load conditions things change what is the egr amount what is the egr system design that you're going to have and then comes important questions like okay what is the amount of swirl that you have what is the amount of mass flow rate that you have how are you going to achieve this mass flow rate and i think we had a question regarding mass flow rate like what is the intake pressure that i need to achieve a particular mass flow rate so these are the questions that you ask and rajeshekar in your case if you think about it your question is uh, if you look at your question right it basically says how to increase the mass flow rate now you need to understand that mass flow rate contains velocity in it right so when you say increasing velocity yes it can if you increase your velocity you can still have the same mass flow rate if your density is lower right so the only way you can have an increased mass flow rate is by increasing the pressure because when you increase the pressure density increases and your velocity also increases resulting in more mass flow rate okay then comes your valve dynamics how does your valve open when does the valve close what's the profile and then what's the trapped mass in your engine right and how much leakage occurs in the engine that is called as blow by so this is the level of detail to which you need to understand your engine system so that in each of these blocks you can work on an optimization study but just look at it we have not even come to the combustion part yet and that is where you have your fuel air mixture now once fuel and air come they are going to mix and this is what is called as the charge condition and there are several types of conditions you have premixed you have partially premixed you have non premixed and then what's going to happen well you have your fuel air mixture now after this compression is going to take place now at this point you will have heat transfer through your wall which means you need to be understanding engine block design you need to understand the coolant system design how the engine is packaged and how the engine interf in, uh, interfaces with the power train or how, how is your power train designed right understanding all these things is very very important because optimizing an engine means you can change any of these blocks and after this you have your combustion right now that to understand combustion process you need to understand the chemical kinetics of the fuel how do to how do two reactants react to form a product that is at the end of the day chemical kinetics so you need to understand that and then you need to understand how emissions occur so these are called as mechanism pathways or reaction pathways they determine how air and fuel react to form different species when you understand this you understand how emissions are formed and only when you understand this process you are able to design emission systems for example exhaust gas recirculation is a by product of this understanding okay and once you do that you need to understand parameters like heat release rate combustion efficiency and temperature distribution to design anything okay so this is the level of detail at which the industry today looks at your engine because any optimization that was possible by the simplified diagram that i presented earlier is already been done okay all right so any questions at this point guys let's all take 30 seconds to ask questions if you don't have any questions you can just say that i don't say that you don't have any questions that's fine no questions all right is thermal conductivity also a parameter yes absolutely so egr comes only in diesel engine yes that's correct well you can have egr in other types of engines also for example even in gasoline engines you can have egr but primarily it is very common in diesel engines okay tamis i hope your audio connection is now okay it's true that egr system reduces emissions but doesn't putting in unburnt carbon in the combustion why would you why would it damage like how would how would it damage a truck unburnt your fuel is nothing but unburnt carbon right 
so if your fuel is not damaging your engine why would unburnt carbon and gas phase damage it so whenever you have unburnt carbon yes that's going to affect your emissions so you need to think of it like what is it that you are trying to achieve by exhaust gases so exhaust gas recirculation is primarily a technique that is done to lower the temperature of the combustion products and when it lowers the combustion temperature you are reducing nox so in the process yes you can affect your combustion efficiency yes that's correct does oil uh, does gallery cool so you are referring to something called as gallery cooling right so gallery cooling uh, that's a great question i don't know what your actual name is it seems like your name is set to your mobile phone's name zuk z1 um so sorry narendran actually does oiled galleric cooled piston so you're referring to gallery cooled pistons give good combustion well you need to understand that gallery cooling is for cooling the piston right so that has nothing to do with combustion it just makes sure that your piston is maintained at the optimum temperature what is the purpose of mua tube in snorkel of ic engine uh, i don't know what you're saying so if you maybe tell me what mua is i might be able to answer your question okay and in general when it comes to uh, in when it comes to cooling right you need to understand what's the idea there so the reason why you have cooling is to make sure that your engine components are maintained at a safe temperature ideally if you can run a engine without cooling that's actually best because when you're running your coolant system you are spending a lot of energy okay you're spending you are spending engine power to run the coolant system so that is actually a parasitic loss right so if you don't have a cooling system you will actually gain 10 to 15% more efficiency which is basically going to improve your mileage but unfortunately if the engine is large you cannot just have you cannot just air cool it you also need liquid cooling and especially for your engine components you will have drilled passage ways in your piston in your connecting rod also in your engine block so that's why when you see the engine block there are a lot of tiny holes in it okay and these are all meant to keep the engine at a safe operating temperature so in a way it it does not give good combustion it actually reduces the it actually reduces your total efficiency of your engine because cooling system is being run by the engine power you need to understand that uh, zug z1 i i think you should like i said you need to give me a little bit more information about your question like when you say mua tube can you expand mua all right okay so let me move on guys so uh, what are the current techniques that are available to actually look inside an engine well there are several methods that you have okay and one of the techniques that's available is called as the shadow graph or schlieren imaging so let me just play this video first i'll just play it a couple of time and then so that you can see what's actually happening in there okay so i hope you saw it i'll just play it again okay so couple of things i want you to notice uh on the left hand side you have a non vaporizing engine and on the right hand side you have a vapor not not a vapor not a non vaporizing engine but a non vaporizing case and on the right hand side you have vaporizing case can anyone tell me what's the difference what does non vaporizing mean and what does vaporizing mean how do i achieve that how what what are the, what are the things that i need to change to make something non vaporizing and make something vaporizing
right my question is what is it what is it that you change in your combustion chamber to make sure that the fuel is non vaporizing size of molecules no no that's not right i think you need to think of a much more simpler answer non vaporizing is partially burnt fuel no that's completely wrong that's not correct well no i think you guys are missing the fundamental point right what makes the fuel to vaporize it's the temperature so a non vaporizing fuel is achieved by making sure that the combustion combustion temp combustion chamber temperature is lower in the vaporizing case the temperature is just higher so what you are actually looking at is a constant volume chamber right it's a constant volume and the thing is it's filled with hot air in the left hand side the temperature of the air is not that much and that's why the fuel is not vaporizing on the right hand side the temperature of the air is quite high so that's what's causing the fuel to vaporize so shadowgraph is a technique that allows you to um look at density difference so in non vaporizing case your liquid density is going to, is liquid density is higher right and that's why it shows up as black because density of liquid is quite high um it's maybe 700 times higher than density of air so that's why it shows up but in vaporizing case your fuel is converting getting converted to vapor which means its density is reducing and hence that is why on the right hand side you see that oops and that is why on the right hand side you see that immediately you have this scars regions because that's where vaporization takes place now these type of experiments are being done for couple of reasons first they actually help you understand what's going on and then you do this and then you look at engine simulations right so that way you can actually make sure that your engine simulations is also predicting the same thing that the experiment provides uh zug z1 makeup air tube okay uh, i'm not sure what that means to be honest so what i will do is i just look at what it is and uh, if i figure out what the answer is i'll let you know but i don't know i've i've, I've never heard of makeup air tube before maybe i i know it with a different term so let me do some reading on it and then i'll get back to you okay other techniques so what you are looking at here is actually something called as an x ray full field phase contrast imaging okay the reason why it's called ultra fast synchrotron is because it can it has very high temporal resolution so what you are actually looking at here is a fuel injector <clears throat> right now this right here is a nozzle inside an injector you know how small this is this is 0.1 mm right and just look at how look at the resolution that we are getting in <clears throat> we are getting right so this is the level of detail to which people look at engines nowadays right and if you look at here what you are looking at is the liquid fuel and on the left and right it's two plumes of liquid fuel and they completely different right you can see that the shape is quite different why is that it's the same injector well that occurs because even though that the surface looks smooth there's a lot of surface roughness and that's going to cause different flow patterns in different areas right again why do people do this well they look at this and then they simulate this using computational fluid dynamics so that they can compare the answers okay so far we have been looking at only at fuel spray how about combustion well for looking at combustion you use something called as chemical luminescence it's a technique where you actually uh, track radicals in your fuel primarily hydroxyl radicals so that you can visualize where combustion takes place all right so moving on what are the additional devices that you have well you have temperature and pressure sensors again you need to understand that the reason why so much data is being collected from the engines 
is because nowadays it's being used to feed input into your simulations. So simulations take all this data and they try to predict the combustion behavior. And that is why people are spending a lot of money on experiments these days. Okay, merits and demerits, I think it's very easy to understand. First of all, experimental data, experimental data or experiments give you highly accurate and high quality data. The demerits is that you have very low temporal resolution. The setup is very complex and it's prone to errors. In other words, it's also costly, right? Because if you make a mistake, you repeat this, repeat the thing again. And you need to actually build the engine for it. You need to manufacture the engine for it. But IC engines, the idea is, IC engine simulations, the idea is it's very cost effective. Why? Because you just need a computer to do it and you need a CAD model, which is relatively cheaper. Um, but the requirement is that you need highly skilled engineers. When I say skilled engineers, what is the knowledge that you need? Well, you need to have a lot of application knowledge, which means a lot of the fundamental terms that I had asked questions about, most of you did not know it. You need to know those things. That's the first requirement. The second requirement is that you need to also have expertise in CFD and computational conversion. Okay. Uh, so today we are not going to be having a live demo because uh, unfortunately I don't have the software in this computer. But where is the industry headed with all these things? Well, they're looking at smaller engines uh, with turbocharging. Why? When you make the engine smaller, it, all of your problems are reduced automatically. For example, heat transfer losses are reduced because your surface area is reducing in total. And when you reduce your engine size, what is the mo what is one of the things that re gets reduced, which gives you a direct benefit? When you make the engine smaller, what is the f what is the immediate benefit that you get? Can anyone answer that? That's exactly correct. The weight is smaller now. And because of that, you immediately see benefit in fuel consumption. Right? And also nowadays, the other trend is, uh, from a manufacturing point of view, is to make more components plastic. So for example, in crack crankcase ventilation, more components are being made out of plastic because mainly it's going to help you reduce the weight. All right. So how to get into engine CFD, right? This is one of the questions that you need that many people ask. First is you need to have thorough knowledge of engine combustion process. Okay. So when I say engine combustion process, just knowing that fuel and air combine to form combustion products is not enough. You need to understand chemical kinetics. You need to understand how reaction mechanisms are developed. Okay. So there are something called as reaction mechanisms and there are something called as thermodynamic property tables that are generated by NASA. So understanding that and how they are being used in combustion calculation is very important. You need to understand what zero D combustion is. You need to understand terms like ignition delay and flame speed. You need to understand things like negative temperature coefficient, right? So this is just on the computational combustion part. With respect to computational fluid dynamics part, you need to understand what initial conditions mean. You need to understand what boundary conditions mean. You need to understand what governing equations are. You need to understand what transport equations are and what is the difference between transport equations and physical models. You need to understand turbulence modeling. You need to understand which turbulence model is better. And on top of this, your application skill, having a good understanding about IC engines. With these three things, you can get into engine CFD quite easily. Okay, looks like we have one question. Let's take a look. What are the simulations done in engines to increase performance? So again, right, performance can be, you can classify performance in several ways. So if you remember the detailed diagram that we looked at, uh, so let me go back to that and I can talk about the types of simulations that are being done. So if you look at this, right? And if you look at fuel components and vaporization, people actually do optimizations on it. So this is not a simulation. It is just computer programming where you, you, where you basically run an optimization so that computationally you are able to create a fuel that mimics your original fuel. So this is called as a surrogate blend optimizer. So you are coming up with a surrogate 
which basically represents the physical properties of the fuel very well and also the chemical properties of the fuel very well. So this is one type of simulation that you can do. As far as the intake port optimization study, you can actually do something called as a flow bench analysis. So people do something called as a flow bench simulation to evaluate the port swirl number, the tumble value, the pressure loss, and they are able to also determine the flow coefficient of your intake and exhaust valves. Okay, now once you get your fuel and air mixture, in order to study that you need to have right turbulence models. So that will give you the right fuel and mixture. And then what you can see do is you can see how homogeneous the fuel and air mixture is, right? You can actually measure that through simulations. And then once combustion takes place, you can measure, you can look at things like, how does knocking occur in your engine? How does cycle to cycle variation occur? Because based on these things, you can modify your designs and redo the things to reduce the undesirable behavior okay so one of the things that people do is for example let us say that in a particular engine model the exhaust valve needs to be replaced quite frequently then what people do is they look at the combustion simulation they look at they do something called as conjugate heat transfer where they look at the solid valve temperatures and they basically see and, and hopefully in that simulation, they will see that the exhaust valves is at a highly unreasonable temperature. And based on that, they can try out better materials. They can maybe modify the valve positions a little bit so that its exposure to combustion temperature has been minimized so that its life is increased. So these are the types of uh, studies that people can do. Or the other thing that they can also uh, do is they can make the cooling system cool the exhaust valves a little bit more, right? they can do that. So uh, these, are, these are just a little bit of examples for how simulations are being used. Uh, any problem that you see in real life in an engine can be simulated nowadays. So th the capability is quite enormous nowadays. And sometimes you can actually study things which you cannot study in uh, real life. Okay, so I hope I answered your question. All right. So the other thing, so that being said, right? Uh, okay, looks like we have one more comment. Let's just take a look at it. Is there a difference between the dimensions of intake and exhaust valve? Yes. So typically, uh, you know, when you look at an engine, your intake valve is larger. Uh, that is mainly because you need to have higher volumetric efficiency. And one of the ways you can have higher volumetric efficiency is to just increase the area. When you increase area, your mass flow rates are going to be higher. Right, so typically inlet, inlet valves are made bigger. What kind of CFD powertrain simulations they perform in electric vehicles? That's a great question. So in electric vehicles, in electric vehicles, you generally work on battery simulations. You can actually run simulations that predict the battery performance, how it, uh, for example, one of the things that you look at, um, electric vehicles is like how the battery performs over time, right? Uh, so that can be simulated. And the other thing that you can do is uh, heat transfer simulations are quite big. The batteries needs to be maintained at ideal temperatures. So you can simulate that. Um, you can simulate how your motor behaves. Heat transfer simulations are involved there because you need to have cooling solutions for your motors as well. And typically, uh, your car body is designed in such a way that there is good amount of airflow to these critical components so that they are cooled effectively. And on top of that, you have external flow analysis as well to make sure that the car has a lower drag coefficient. Uh, 